Uh, if you would, turn with me to the book of Romans. We're going to continue in our series, and I've entitled today's message. We're going to be in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, A New Life. And with this thought process, it wasn't planned this way, but God always brings things together as they should. Um, first of all, we celebrate new life today with Micaiah, uh, his dedication back to the Lord. And just I, every time I, I hold a, a young child, I just think of how precious life is. Amen. It's just an amazing, amazing thing that God has done for us and with us. And, and really, as we get into Scripture, the communion meditation that was done by Al aligns really with the new life that we are to have. And uh, we're going we're gonna to go into Scripture today. Before I start in reading, I, I've got to go backwards and just start us at the right point, the right launching pad, because as we ended last week in Romans chapter 5, the last two verses we didn't really expand upon, but they're extremely important to get Paul's starting point of chapter 6. So I'm going to read uh, Romans chapter 5, the last two verses, verses 20 and 21. If you remember, we talked last week about living under the bondage of death, or either we could choose to reign in life. That was the exact message that the Apostle Paul had for us. We can continue in the old ways, the... the um, Everything we had received from Adam, never accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we can be under the bondage, we can actually be slaves to sin and death, or through the grace of God and belief in Jesus Christ, we can reign in this life. And, and we see starting at verse 20, chapter 5, verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. We have a choice. We can live under the bondage of death or we can reign in life. Scripture's plain about this. The applications from last week, again, as our launching point from last week, through Adam's sin, all of his descendants were born into an imputed sin and the penalty for that sin, which is death. Application number two, Adam gave all of his descendants death. Thank you, Adam. That's what we received from him. But Christ gives all his descendants the free gift of righteousness and eternal life. Application three from last week, through Adam all men are condemned, but through belief in Christ all men are justified, seen by God just as if we have not sinned. And application number four, through Adam death reigns for all, but through faith in Jesus Christ we reign in life. Now back at this verse, verse 20, Paul ends this chapter or where man has provided chapter, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The law was given to Moses and after to magnify sin, for us to know what is sin and what is not, to bring to our attention. But notice the end of that verse, But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Isn't that wonderful? That where there's sin, God says there is much more grace to cover all of that sin. And so the question comes up, and it's our starting point today, if when there's more sin, there's even more grace, why should I worry about sin? Is it okay to sin all I want to? It's a natural question that would come from these verses. Hey, if I'm saved by God's grace for sins of the past, present, and future, I'm, I'm no longer dead to sin. I've put that aside. I'm reigning in life. Then what does it matter if I sin or not? Because if I do, there's even more grace for me. That's what Scripture is saying. And Paul today 
will answer that very question. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again we come to you now at the time, God, where we open your word. And God, we know there is power in your word. God, you tell us in Scripture, your word cannot go out and return void. There will be something accomplished through the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, we just ask you now, as I read your word and expand upon the message, God, that it not be of me, but God, you would use me as your messenger, that your Holy Holy Spirit would call upon hearts, God, and that you would meet us wherever we are. If we are lost and do not know your saving grace, would your Holy Spirit call us closer to you? God, if we are saved but, but we're just traveling this road of sanctification wherever we are, would the message meet us where we are and invite us closer? And God, if we are just joyful and thankful for being here today, living our very best for you, God, would you just continue to encourage us directly direct us, meet us where we are, and grow us more. May there be power in the Word today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Answering the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer Therein. So the question comes, shall we continue to live life in sin? And, and here comes that there's questions that start coming. Well, wait a minute. Even though I'm saved, I still end up sinning. I don't mean to, but sin happens. It kind of jumps on us, right? Remember uh, the analogy I told you about the potholes. You know, there's those potholes out there, and, and when you're a, a new driver, you hit every one of them. But the, the longer, the more experience you have in driving, you, you start to be able to navigate around some of those potholes. And that's how it is in life. If those potholes are sin, when we first become a Christian, we still plow right through them. We still have forgiveness. But as we start to grow in our sanctification with the Lord, we understand where those potholes are. The Word of God magnifies them for us, and we navigate around them. But every now and then, we still catch one of those potholes. And it just tears us up, or it does me inside. So Paul is asking the question, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin knowing that grace is there, that, that grace may abound? He says, no, obviously, of course not. God forbid. How could you? Because you're dead to sin. Paul brings out an important principle here. When you're born again, when you believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation, your relationship with sin changes. Application number one, when you are saved, your relationship with sin changes changes. Some of you are like, well, I didn't know I had a relationship with sin. Oh yeah, we all have a relationship with sin. But that relationship totally changes when salvation comes to our home. You know, if you would go with me, I'm going to hold that spot. We're coming back. One of the many excellent examples is, is in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to start at verse 1 and read through 10. But in Ephesians 2, we see the old self when we lived under sin. And then once we're dead to sin, what changes? It goes along perfect with the communion meditation that was said earlier. Ephesians chapter 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Our sins bring death. Wherein in times past, who we were before, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our living, in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children Children of wrath, even as others, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace we are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us 
through Christ Jesus. For by grace we are saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. By accepting Christ as our Lord and our Savior, we become dead to sin. There's a change that takes place in the believer. You were dead in your sin, but now you are dead to sin. Sin no longer has reign over our life. Remember last week's message again, do you want to live under the bondage of death or reign in life? We as believers choose life. Application number two, before salvation, we are dead in our sin. However, through salvation, we are dead to sin. Sin no longer reigns. And we're going to go into this even further. Sin no longer has reign over us. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism unto death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in a newness of life. The Apostle Paul is going to illustrate the truth that he's just said about us being dead to sin. He's going to use baptism in this illustration. He says, know ye not, meaning this is a foundational truth that we've got to be able to understand. When the believer is baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death. Now, I'm going to speak on baptism for just a moment here because this is one of those things of, of the, the, the services that Christ calls for us to do of communion and baptism. We can get kind of spread out in talking about baptism. And there are different baptisms spoken of in Scripture. I'm going to bring out seven of those, and I'm not going to spend much time on them. I'm just going to throw them out there to you real quick. We're going to move through. You can write down a verse. I'm not going to read it. You can go back and look at it if you want to see where each one of these comes through. Seven different baptisms of Scripture. First of all, in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 3, we get a picture of the baptism of Moses. And what this is saying is those who followed Moses as they went through the Red Sea. They were identified with Moses and the following of Moses. Scripture actually calls it a baptism of Moses. Were they submerged and do the baptism that we understand as the believer's baptism? No. But Scripture is bringing out an identification that those who followed Moses were baptized or in the baptism of Moses. We had the baptism of John in Mark 1, 4, where John is baptizing individuals as a forerunner of Christ. He, it identifies those who were baptized by John in their need to confess their sin. That's Mark 1 and 4. Then we have the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Jesus act of identifying with sinful humanity. He comes to John. John's doing his baptism. Jesus comes. John says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, I must do this. He's setting the example. Jesus was identifying with mankind as sinners. We have the baptism of Jesus. In Matthew 3, 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12, we see the baptism of fire and of the Holy Spirit is mentioned, but focused specifically here on the baptism of fire identifies the final judgment of the world for its sin. We see that from verse 12 as it looks. Then we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit specific. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, it talks about the spiritual baptism that comes with spiritual gifts coming. We, we see this spiritual baptism that takes place. And then we have the baptism of the cross or the baptism of suffering. 
We see one of these in Mark 10, 35 through 39. We see another one in Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 50. Jesus is speaking of the baptism of suffering that He is about to go through for all, for all of us. In, in the Mark example, He's telling the disciples, He says, Do you think you can be baptized? baptized let me get my words out. Do you think you can undergo the baptism in which I'm going to undergo? He wasn't talking about the believer's baptism. He was talking about the suffering that Christ was about to go through. So we see all of these examples. And then number seven, the baptism of believers. When we're given the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, we're told to go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, remembering that He is with us always, even to the ends of the earth. This is the believer's baptism that we are very familiar with, spoken of here. Baptismo, or baptism, the word means an immersion. It's, it's what the definition means. But you see it's used in all of these different incidents, inc <laughs> places. I use my bell author words. It's used in all these places in Scripture. So why do I go through all of that? For us to get a good understanding of what Paul is saying. Because he's talking about grace and sin and death and life. So what is said here? Our baptism, symbolic, has an outward identification with our faith that as we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are put under water. Our old self is put to death. We are buried with Christ. We're put to death. We cannot breathe underwater. And as we are raised, we are raised to a newness of life. We have a new life. Just as Jesus Christ was buried and resurrection takes place and He has new life for the believer, we see baptism having this symbolism. The Holy Spirit comes into our body. The, the outward identification with our faith as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. When we do that, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus as our Lord, our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into our life. We are made new. It's what's spoken of in 2 Corinthians 5 as we look starting at about verse 17 through the rest of that chapter. We become a new creature. Remember, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, God created man. He, he formed him from the dust of the ground. He breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We are made of body, soul, and spirit. This is Carney's body. I know you all want it, but I'm the only one that's got it. This is my body, right? I have a soul. The soul was given to me upon life. God breathed. My, his breath into me when I became a man. I have, this, I have the soul that God has given me. And I have my spirit. Now before I knew Jesus, I had my spirit, man's spirit. But something takes place on that day that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I get a new spirit. That's the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of me. We become new. Every believer is the temple of God. God Himself through His Spirit lives inside of us. Scripture tells us this plainly. So we know this takes place when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Baptism, again, is one of two ordinances that Christ gives the church. Communion and baptism. Everybody, every believer should be baptized. Let me say that again. Every believer should go through water baptism. It's an ordinance that Christ gave to the church. And it identifies with the truth that Paul is speaking of here. That you are dead to sin. You've been planted. You're dead to sin. The old you is put to death. Just as Jesus was dead and buried, we've been buried with Him. And we are raised to new life. It's what Paul is speaking of here.
Water baptism, again, pictures some wonderful spiritual truths. When we're saved, your old self is put to death. We're buried with Christ, but we rise and we are resurrected to a newness of life. Our sins have been washed away. We are cleansed. But it's spiritual baptism that saves us. It is your faith. I, I had somebody pose a question to me one time about baptism, and they said, look, if, if it was just the act of baptism and not faith, wouldn't we go out and tackle everybody we could and drag them into the baptistry? <laughs> If, if it was the act itself without faith. You see, faith is essential. We've got to have faith. We are saved by our faith. But Jesus made it plain. Every believer should participate in communion and remember what it's about. It is about God sending forth His Son who died on the cross for all of sin. And we should participate in baptism. And if you have not done that, then after service today, I want you to come up and talk to me about that because it is a plain ordinance given to us of Scripture. It is essential in the Christian faith. Spiritual baptism saves us. Water baptism is an outward expression of that event. So he says here, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death. We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may be raised to a new life. Application number three. It's a long one. That's why you got it in your bulletin. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death. We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may be raised to a new life. Let's look at the last part of that verse 4 a new life. Even so, we should walk in a newness of life. This is a strategic point that Paul is bringing out here. Paul's point is this. Your life should be changed. Something radical has happened in the life of every believer. You cannot die, be raised again to new life, and not be changed. Something has got to take place in the believer. So he goes on in verses 5 through 7. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we've been buried with him, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So he says in verse 5, we've been planted together. This is unified with Christ. In his death, the old us died when Christ died. And we've been resurrected. We've been resurrected into a new spirit, a new life. Verse 6 speaks specifically of the old man, our old identity with Adam. This is everything Paul has been bringing us to this point. Our old man, our identity with Adam has now been put to death. That identity with Adam, you know what it looks like? It's trying to obtain proper position by our works, by doing what we can do and not trusting in what He has done. All of that is put to death. We've been crucified with Christ in verse 6. The following of uh, sin has been destroyed. We no longer want to participate in habitual, repeated sin. It's not what we plan to do. There's a change in our life. Our being under the bondage of sin has been eliminated. He tells us in verse 7, we've been freed from sin. We no longer live under the bondage of death. There is a change. Galatians 5.24 puts it this way as speaking of, of the Spirit being inside of us. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. We've put the old man to death. Application number four. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our old man is put to death. So what does he say in verse 8? If we be dead with Christ... We believe we shall also live with Him. 
we shall also live with him. He speaks of a new man. In fact, if you'll go back with me, hold that spot. I'm going to read from the book of Ephesians and from the book of Colossians. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, he says this starting at verse 20. Before verse 20, he speaks of our old self. And I'm starting mid-sentence in verse 20. He says this, Ephesians 4.20. But you have not so learned Christ, the old man, under sin. If so, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That's that change that starts taking place. I'm no longer being taught by sin. I'm now going to be taught through the truth of Jesus. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You are new. And that you put, off, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. If we move forward two chapters, we go to the book of Colossians chapter 3. It says this starting in verse 10. Colossians 3 starting in verse 10. And you've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Again, we're new, life modeled after Christ. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what your background is. Christ says you put your faith and trust in Him. You are new. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. We are to live in Him, with Him. The new life is modeled, the change is modeled by God's very Word, the examples that Christ has given us. Read with me Romans 6, 9. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Christ who is raised from the dead will never die again. Christ defeated death at His resurrection. The, the enemy didn't know that. The devil thought he had won when Christ had been put to death. He had no idea that all his maneuvering uh, against God and against Christ of having Christ put to death was all God's plan. And God overcame death when Jesus Christ th three days later was resurrected. It tells us in verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin. Sin had a reign. It had a price, a penalty. It was death. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. The penalty for sin, death. Death was accomplished. Jesus Christ died for all sin. And Scripture tells us his perfect, sinless body dying for all sin, that one death was enough. But notice it says, in that he lives, he lives unto God. This is the changed life. It's for us. We live through Christ. We live unto God. Notice it says in verse 11, here's the likewise. Here's where it pulls us in. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Christ is dead to sin. We are dead to sin. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's our new life. And there's going to be times we fail in that walk. We are going to step into sin. Sin will jump upon us, but it's okay. Okay. 
because Christ already died for sin. And those who believe in Him through His grace who have received His imputed righteousness and the promise of eternal life, even though we may sin, God's got a promise for us because of our faith, not because we've done anything right, but because of God's grace. The old us who is alive to sin has been buried. The new us is alive in Christ, His Holy Spirit living inside of us. You've been given a new life, but you haven't been given a new life to live for yourself. Scripture's plain. We've been given a new life to live unto God. We're no longer living for ourselves. We're living in and for purpose that God has created. Application number five as we conclude. Shall we as believers continue to live in habitual sin? The answer is no. We live life changed. We should live as a new man or woman for the purpose of God through Jesus Christ. When Paul in chapter 6 verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That verbiage, translation that would take place means repetitive or I'm using the word habitual sin. It's that sin you plan. Should we live there so grace would abound more? The answer is clear, no. You have a new life. Your old self has been buried with Christ. You've been resurrected into a new life. And although these bodies, if Jesus Christ doesn't come back in our human lifetime, these bodies are going to get old and decrepit and stop working and die. Our soul continues. We have eternity with the Father. That's the new life. When we are born again, we are born into God's kingdom, into our new life. Shall we as believers continue to live in habitual sin? No. We live life changed. We should live as new men or women for the purpose of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not how man would write it. Man couldn't come up with this. But in God's love, it is how God declared it. It is how He designed it. He created us, and let me say this for clarity, there are no mistakes. God did not create a mistake in any person, no matter who they are, no matter what's going on in our life. If we are here, God had a purpose in it, and He has a purpose for our life. If you are living and breathing today, no matter what you think, you are still living for God's purpose. He has a purpose for you today. And if He gives you tomorrow, He has a purpose for you specifically tomorrow. And it's all to bring glory to Him. It is to live your life in a way that people, not only your words, but your actions, they will see your actions and just wonder, what is it that, that makes this person be full of joy? Or how does this person live this way under this circumstance? It all points back to, to Jesus. Because we have the peace of God inside of our hearts. And so if you're here, He created you with purpose. And if we're here today, we are to use that purpose to bring Him honor and glory. Don't listen to the enemy who will put in your mind you are not good enough or you don't have purpose. Listen to me. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have through faith accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your old you from Adam has been put to death. You have a new life. Baptism tells us of this, of the spiritual things that have taken place that in our faith, the old us has been replaced with the new. That God's Holy Spirit now lives inside of us. And with that, we start to grow and walk in life in an understanding, we live unto God. Isn't that a wonderful truth? That's the newness of life. We are to live 
unto God. I'm going to ask us to stand. I'm going to close us in prayer. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then don't let another day go by. I ask you to respond to the message today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and this time we've been able to assemble together in the unity of the name of Jesus. And God, I thank you for, for the Apostle Paul, and I thank you for the words you had him pen, and God, that we have your very words today. And God, I thank you for the truth that is exhibited in your word and God, your promise to us is the Holy Spirit will continue to bring those truths to us. And God, we rely on that. We thank you for it. And God, as the message is plain, should we as believers continue in habitual sin knowing that your grace abounds? The answer is no. We've been given new life. And in that new life, we are to live unto you that's our sanctification, our growth of getting closer and closer to you by studying your word and meditating on your word, by living the life you've called us to live and understanding when we fall short, God, that you still love us. You've forgiven us. We confess our sins, God, and you tell us you've removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Your grace is sufficient. God, we proclaim our belief through Believers' baptism through immersion in water that shows I am making a statement, God. My old self has been put to death. I am coming to life new with my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. God, I thank you again that you give us your words and your direction so we can understand who you are, your character, your love. And God, I just ask you as we go out today, may we exercise the truths we know, whether they're new to us today or whether we've just been encouraged by the Word. And God, if your Holy Spirit is calling upon us, may we listen to that call and may we respond. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Remember, there is no small groups tonight. Wednesday night, everything starts back on our normal schedule. God bless you.